Hi and welcome to In the Field, a, a series of short interviews with artists and musicians living in the Bay Area, uh, San Francisco and beyond. Um, today I'm talking with uh, Bob Marsh, uh, instrumentalist, composer, uh, multi, uh, you know, interdimensional painter, uh, <laughs> basically a, a renaissance man of our time. And uh, Bob is uh, going to be performing at the uh, Outsound New Music Summit in uh, San Francisco on July, uh, well actually you'll be at Touch the Gear on July 18th and then you'll be performing with Cardew Choir on July 23rd. That's right. So uh, thank you for allowing us to come into your home and talk with you sure. for a little while there. Um, I'll start out with asking a question I've asked every artist that we've talked to. Um, what, um, what was it that uh, you remember in your early life that drew you to uh, the sound and music? Or memorable experience. Uh, I have a very clear memory of a very musical experience uh, when I was very young, I, four, three, and also my first invented instrument. Uh, it was an empty lot uh, next to my grandmother's house, and uh, I made a xylophone out of one stick. The ground was sort of dished out a bit, and I had a stick there, and I had two sticks to play it so I could hear the sound. And across on the other side of this empty lot uh, lived a fierce chow dog, and uh, he was uh, known to be, uh, well, he looked strange anyhow to me. Okay. He looked like a, a bear or, or a wolf or some fierce kind of thing. And he was... Uh, his owners were very strange, and so it was a very fearsome uh, beast. And I crouched down on the ground and played the stick dun, 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 and made up a song. The song only had one word in it, which was chow. And it was chow, 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 chow. So I suppose this was early uh, pulse music. This would be, uh, let's see, it must be. How old were you? 1948, oh, okay. 1946, okay. 19, no, 1948, something like that. Right. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> anyhow, that's that's a uh, a vision that came up, uh, or a, not more than a vision, a whole feeling right. that uh, came to me later. That I felt that it took me many, many years to get back to that state. I feel I'm sort of in that state now, chow, 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 chow. chow. Right, okay. Yeah. Uh, but it was, uh, I was divorced, and, well, not divorced, but uh, kept from that state by uh, the educational system. Okay. Uh, uh, particularly the uh, Sisters of Mercy. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> the Merciless Sisters of Mercy, uh, I did not do well in music uh, there. I felt uh, completely removed from my voice, uh, couldn't sing, etc. There was lots of troubles, and I uh, so uh, so the Sisters of Mercy weren't necessarily, uh, you know, uh, influ musical influences on you. No, absolutely the opposite. They uh, they kept me from uh, from developing that. It took a long time to get around the system. Very, all of the all of the systems, but that was the the important uh, beginning uh, for me. Something that you remember deeply, yeah, right, right. So, um, when was it that you decided or found music again, or was it certain individuals that influenced you, or you just fell on it again later in life, or you got away from the Sisters of Mercy? Well, in in high school, and I was listening to. Uh, Miles Davis, and he was my hero in high school. Miles Davis and Kind of Blue came out. I listened to that like 10,000 times. And uh, I was playing bongos, and it was sort of the, uh, the beat generation, a sort of a junior beat. My brother was a sort of beatnik poet in Detroit. And he still is. I followed him around. <laughs> and, well, he's not in Detroit anymore. Well, he's in Dublin, is. but he's... Uh, uh, yeah. So... Uh, And I used to play with my drumsticks on his 12-string guitar, 
uh, so there was a very avant-garde musician then, <laughs> and so I'm back to playing with drumsticks on the guitar now. Uh, but uh, it, it drove him crazy, so he taught me these chords to play, and I played uh, Michael Row the Boat Ashore and all those folk songs. He was uh, also president or founded the Detroit Folklore Society, and he had folk music programs on the radio in Detroit. And yeah. So I was. Uh, a folky for a while until I discovered, uh, I said, well, if this is a flatted seventh chord, what does a regular seventh chord sound like? And I think, ah, they were keeping me from this, uh, from this. So uh, I began to look into jazz stuff and to improvise oh, okay. and yeah. uh, was sort of a, a jazzy improviser for a while. And, and then also began to think of, uh, you know, was reading and hearing about 12-tone stuff. And so I said, ah, oh, well, what happens when you uh, do that? And also I, I played uh, sitar for a while. I had a big thing with uh, Indian music and ragas. And I played raga-style guitar for some period of time. And uh, I bought a sitar, played sitar, and ragas, and... Uh, Somehow began to one, but somebody told me that the, the Naraga theory was that the the first most important note of the raga, the body, uh, which is usually the tonic, is like the uh, king or ruler of all the other notes in the raga, and the sound body, which is usually the fifth, not always, but is the minister, and the king and minister uh, rule over the notes of the raga, and uh, they can let in the enemy or outsiders one at a time if they're closely watched over by the uh, king and minister. But, uh, I uh, went for democracy and let everybody in. Right. <laughs> Finally, at <laughs> yeah. some point, I just uh, began to work uh, you know, with all the tones okay. and all of the things in between the tones and then all of the sounds as well that you could possibly 